Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the first 2022 uh, office hour session for Cryptographer. Um, we really appreciate that you joining us live or watching the recording, especially with all the difficult circumstances we are living in the world again right now. Okay, so remember that the goal of uh, the office hours space is to discuss potential improvement ideas uh, for the project in the form of RFCs and also in general questions that you may have for the maintainers team. So let me share my screen. Uh, see the agenda. There you go. Uh, okay, uh, first of all, who like to take notes today? Anyone else? I can take notes. Thank you, Emily. That's definitely helpful. Okay, we see a further discussion topic regarding the CRD change proposal. I don't know who this is from. That is me. Uh, yeah, so uh, we just we just had a conversation with folks looking to create a GUI for uh, for supply chains, um, and I think one of the pain points that is looming for them is how to know that a deliverable on one cluster relates to a workload on another cluster. Um, and that's driven primarily because the uh, the field that specifies that right now is kind of ad hoc. Uh, if you look at the example Git writers that we have, they leverage parameters on the workload spec rather than a dedicated field. Uh, and if we want to make it easy for yeah, if we want to make it really declarative and really easy to say like, oh, here's the field on a workload and here's the field on a deliverable and they match. And so these two uh, are a pair. Uh, we should make that uh, uh, that config destination field uh, a top level spec location in the workload. Uh, and I suppose that means that we would also need that for deliverable because deliverables could uh, do verification and then promote to another environment. I think the only thing that I can think of that might be a problem is, is that configuration isn't always specified by the workload, right? It could be specified in the supply chain where uh, like eventually you might just want to configure like an org in the supply chain where things might end up or a mono repo or something where and then the supply chain itself um, might dump your config into a, just a known bucket within that org or within that repo. And so there might not be, like, so there might be an implicit one-to-one -one mapping between like a workload and where that config ends up, but it might not be known uh, in the workload configuration. So like, do you know what I mean? I do. Um, I think that, uh, I think that, that goes back to the challenge for anybody that's trying to create uh, a layer on top that 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 GUI tool would have to crawl the supply chain, read every template, determine which template is writing configuration, and then determine how that configuration is. Uh, like what fields that configuration is relying upon in order to relate workloads and deliverables. And I think it would be a much better pattern for us to say like, yeah, if you, if you have an org wide uh, mono repo, you, gotta specify, you have to specify that in the workload. Like that, that's, that's something that, that, your, that your organization will, will have to be comfortable sharing. Yeah, so I want to echo the concerns Josh raised that a workload, specifically the developer authoring the workload, might not know this information. 
and to make it that a stronger statement and say the workload should not know this information. Like this is fundamental to the inversion of control patterns between developers and operators, where a developer is defining the workload resource and saying, here's my workload that I'm putting forward. And like, this is my source code. And like, this is how it should get built, uh, which is completely different than an operator's concern of where do we take this config and how do we deploy it? So, so specifically we... the case of like the mono repo, like that is even more a case where like the developers on individual workloads should not be setting that. Cause like those values will change depending on environments. So like you could imagine a developer iterating on a workload as part of their development day to day where they don't want it being pushed into a mono repo because it's not ready for that. It's only once they've done their work and then it's ready to get promoted into a new environment. And then that, tar that value is gonna change. So if that value exists in the workload resource, then the workload is importable across environments. Is there a, do you have a solution, Scott, on how we can tie the workload and deliverable together? Uh, I, think I had a conversation with Ciro about this before the holiday, um, but effectively, like, there, there kind of needs to be something between, and I haven't thought this through fully, so like, forgive me if this is a little rough and I fumble a little bit, um, but sort of the, the core essence of the idea was the same way that supply chains have selectors that select workloads to be processed. You could have the config writers kind of do the same thing so that a config writer could pull in multiple workload definitions and basically say, okay, I want to take all these and then write something for that into some other location. So it could be like, you could have something that says, okay, I want to match like a very specific subset of workloads. We could say, I want to have something that takes all the workloads in a namespace and then does something with that config. I was thinking something that like might be a little simpler along those lines, right? Because like, if we think about the config writer itself, like it's going to write to a location and it's going to write a commit, right? that actually, that output actually conforms to our existing uh, source template, right? And so like all of, even though a workload might not know explicitly like where its config is gonna end up, it in its status, once we start talking about like artifacts and stuff, it could ultimately end up with an artifact that points to that exact commit at that exact repo. And so like once you're, you, once you, once we have a tool that can parse what the artifacts in the status of a workload look like, we could in theory, you know, match up outputs to something in a deliverable that's an input. Uh, I think if you know the, well, I guess, I guess one, one thing that we could do is have a template type for that config writer and then say like every, we assume that a supply chain that is trying to write to, that is trying to promote is going to use that promotion template. And then that promotion template exposes some value on it, then that, then that artifact would be reflected on the workload. But isn't the promotion template the same as the source template? And it, it like the only difference is that uh, no. it's like, no. Oh, well, what, what would the interface for a promotion template? Oh, like? would it be? Oh, would it? Uh, let me back up. Yes, the, uh, you could use a source template to do that. Uh, the challenge being that uh, from the from a GUI from a GUI's perspective. How does it know that it should be referencing uh, like which uh, which source template should it be uh, leveraging to pair up workloads and deliverables? So if we specify there's one promotion template, like you, you can use zero or one promotion templates in a supply chain, then it's very clear uh, 
this uh, yeah the, the output of the promotion template is the uh, the key. But if our visualization tool, like at the end of the, our visualization tool may only, may not need to look at that information, right? Because if we are actually building out a tree of artifacts in the workload itself, right? You could parse that tree and could follow all the, you know, uh, this commit produced this image, produced blah, produce blah, produce blah. And that if you built out that tree, right? You could see that at the end of that tree, you have an artifact that ended up as uh, a source. And then if you're, if, so then my tool, if I'm looking at a workload and a deliverable, I can see that these two things match. Because like yeah, I mean, otherwise I mean, I, you would, if you had I a specific that, template type. Like could, could you build you a case a where template. you. Sorry, go ahead. Like I, I could you I, I could you build in conventions uh, that would allow you to associate them? Yes. Uh, those sound like they're getting a little bit fragile. Like you're just like, hey, if there's a source template at the end of your supply chain, then uh, you should always assume that that is uh, uh, that that's a config config written to a repo or a registry. Um, yeah, we, we could we could say that that is a convention that all tools that use cartographer, that, that all supply chain authors must follow. But that seems but, like a so, more so fragile a small convention distinction. than. Mm -hmm. Just a small distinction of what I'm saying, right? All I'm saying is that like I, I could I totally agree that maybe you're right. Like maybe this does need its own template type to be more explicit and stuff. But technically all I'm saying is that it, all we would need to do in that case is we wouldn't need to know that this is a source template. All we would need to know is that the final artifact in a workloads artifact graph matches the first artifact in a deliverables artifact graph. And like the distinction to me is like the workload doesn't know about like in in so based on RFC 14 or whatever, right? It it's not it doesn't really know about template types and stuff. All it really knows about is artifacts. And so like from the workload's perspective, if we had a promotion template whose interface looked a lot like a source template, it probably wouldn't matter based on that graph because the, the interface for that artifact would be a revision and a URL and you know whatever else is in there. That that's that's all I'm saying. But like if if we wanted to get into the business of interpreting a supply chain and like understanding, you know, how templates and how like a promotion template can lead to, you know, other clusters and stuff like that, then I uh, fully agree that we might want a custom uh, template type for this. Uh, um, I think the so one I, I I think you're right. Like you could just opportunistically say, "Here's the last uh, here's the last artifact uh, in a workload, and it matches the first artifact in this deliverable." Um, uh, it it does necessitate telling people uh, don't use a config. Uh, or don't use a bare, bare template as we do now. Like all of our uh, config writers are just the templates that don't output any any value. Um, uh, yeah, okay. yeah but, uh, I think that could be a that's certainly a a first step that we could that we could take to the you know we could make that change. Um, and have our examples be source uh, use source templates at the end, and then see and then look for feedback from consumers of cartographer and and GUI writers and see what they think.
Is it a little um, strange that we would be changing examples? And if we're not using like a third party tool like the visualizer, that it wouldn't make sense why we are using a different template? Uh, so are you saying like is this an argument for like for using a source template or using a promotion template? I'm just saying it seems a little confusing to just change the templates in our examples without like ha there being a reason for it, right? The reason is because of a third party tool, not because of anything cartographer needs it for. That's true. I think part, part of my uh, part of my statement is I think this is the the multi cluster story for uh, an application platform it seems pretty robust, and this is a problem that I think any uh, any team that wanted to leverage Cartographer as part of that platform would have to figure out. It's like, how do I relate the workloads to the deliverables? And the, the way I see it too is kind of like, technically the Git writer, like there, you're right, it doesn't necessarily need to be wrapped in another template, but for, but if I think about the supply chain, it seems more correct to say like the, the last thing in the supply chain is like an output, is an artifact, right? It's like, even though we don't have it, like necessarily anything consuming it directly, um, it seems like that last thing being an artifact makes sense. I also wanted to point out the, that there's a bit of a mismatch in terms of how source templates are used um, currently because the artifact is the SHA, but for workload deliverable, we wouldn't want that. The deliverable is going, isn't going to know about the SHA, it's going to know about some branch, uh, and then its its first Git source template is going to be responsible for turning that branch into a particular shot, a particular URL. Um, uh, yes. Technically, the it's it's a but, yes. So so yeah, like. Uh, uh, one has to be careful writing the template uh, to, to expose the branch rather than expose the commit SHA. Well, I think the, the thing there, right? Even though if we think of the deliverable doesn't reference the SHA directly, like the, the things that operate under the hood on that deliverable are gonna have an output that knows exactly about that specific commit. And the thing that we wanna trace is that specific commit. Right, like we actually want to be able to, because because the thing that we want to tie is, we want to say, hey, this source code commit produced this config commit, produced this running thing somewhere, right? And so you're right, there might be an abstraction where the the deliverable talks about, you know, to track this branch, but we actually want to be able to trace the underlying artifact that gets produced along the way. So like maybe maybe we skip the like. What if we're building out that graph, right? Like maybe the, the deliverable isn't actually part of that graph and we just map the the commit artifact of the config to the first thing, like the first like git repository in the the next delivery chain or something like that. Uh, I can see a use case for that. It seems a bit limiting, but presumably you, know, you can, the users can make that choice. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, like, yeah. So you're saying like a delivery could point to a specific commit. Is that what you're saying? Because like the user can make that choice, or what? What user? What choice are you saying the user can make? I mean, I, I as a user would want to have some visualization of here's here's the workload and here's the uh, 
the deliverable in the uh, in the staging cluster, and here is the de deliverable in the production cluster. And I would just want to be able to to visualize here's where things are all the way through. And I wouldn't want that visualization to break at the moment that the Git writer made some commit and the the GUI tool suddenly was like, well, there's no deliverable that has that commit SHA. So I don't know where, like, so I don't know what's going on. Um, and then suddenly right. when the deliverable picks up that next, uh, that next change on that branch and says like, oh, now I'm, now I'm reporting this artifact, then suddenly the visualization like becomes whole again. Right, because like the, the deliverable itself is actually like a stream of versions. It represents like a stream of versions, right? And mm -hmm. what we need to visualize is actually like one line of versions throughout the system. So it's like the workload represents a stream of versions, the deliverable represents a stream of versions, and there could be like multiple commits that we need to associate back to like both those underlying concepts. So we need to be able yeah, to associate the, two things, right? We need to be able to associate a source commit ties back to a config commit, and we need to be able to associate those both those version streams back to their underlying um, like workload and deliverable. Yeah, it just seems like it, it's it, the logic is much simpler to say, uh, yeah, this writer is committing to this branch and this reader is reading from that branch rather than doing some logic of this writer has made five commits of this SHA to this re repository and this reader has picked up five of those SHAs and so they must be related. And like, let's, let's keep them, uh, keep them related. Um, but, but I think like, either way works. I don't I think we need a direct mapping, right? Like we need a direct line from like this source commit produced this config commit produced like this revision and a K native service or whatever the endpoint thing that we want to show is. It's like we, we can't just say like we can't just say they're associated through this branch by some mechanism. We have to like point specific commits that map to specific things. I. Uh, yeah, I don't think the other approach precludes that. Um, but okay, I, I sorry, I kind of don't think I follow your point anymore. So um, if you. Yeah, maybe it does uh, you would I guess if you if you were only exposing to the GUI the uh, the branch that you're committing to and maybe the subpath that you're committing to uh, uh, <sighs> Yeah, back up. Uh, here's a question: Should should we retain the? Okay, or to put in a parking lot, a question: Should we retain the bear the bear template any longer? Should there should there be the option to do work that is not uh, reported back that doesn't have some artifact reported back to the cluster? Um, sorry, reported back to the workload that would result in some change in status on the workload. Um, not necessarily a question we need to answer right now. Um, I think we'll always need to keep it for, you know, folks that want to do like for inner loop use cases, right? Where a supply chain, mm, I say that, sorry, maybe not. I don't know. You're right. Open question. <laughs> um, to to loop back really really quickly, uh, I I think that the 
the model that you were suggesting where you report here's the here's the uh, the URL and the SHA where the commit has been made. Uh, uh, does that entail, does that necessitate that once a deliverable has uh, picked up one of those SHAs, has read one of those SHAs, then uh, that delivery is associated with that workload forevermore? Um, yeah. So did by who? Uh, like by any, I guess. Uh, you mean like so? Co is it concretely associated? No, but can it be associated? I would argue yes. I guess. Uh, You know, uh, not concretely. I, obviously, we're talking about like other tools that are going to be layered on top of. So I'm I'm trying to think out like what is the uh, what logical assumptions can those tools be programmed to make? Um, uh, so okay, separate question. Uh, when we were talking about the mono repo, uh, presumably you would have commits to uh, one repository, uh, you can have them on the same branch, but in different file paths in that branch. Um, how would we, can we use the source template to associate in that case? I, I don't think there's any difference. I'm just going off the top of my head here. Um, Cause that's an interesting question, but like, I don't think there's any difference, right? Because all we're saying is it's a snapshot of the files under this massive thing. Like uh, there's other tools down the line that might implicitly rely on a uh, sub path. But I think that the, the commit still holds, right? It still gives I, us the proper version of the, uh, the underlying files that we want, that we care about. It would, my, my concern is that you would get a situation where, let's say you have two teams that commit to the same repo uh, for their Git, uh, their Git ops between supply chain and deliverable. Uh, I think we would have to preclude using subpaths for that because you would say uh, uh, team A uh, you know, commits to uh, the team A directory, team B commits to the team B directory, uh, the deliverable for both of their teams would pick up uh, every commit from team A and team B. And it would only be the next step in the, uh, in the process that would disambiguate those different directories. Oh, I think that's Flux's job is to like differentiate where like uh, things have changed for this path. Right, so I think, like, I'm not sure if Flux. I don't think Flux this, supports subpaths, but I think they should, right? Like in this model, if we're talking about this model, I think they they should kind of thing, right? Like, I mean, it's, I mean, uh, the the general model is that you have the bundle, or, the, or sorry, you have the tarball that represents whatever the Flux resource is pointing at. And then, if you choose to only care about a subpath within that, then that's your business. So then, so like for, for example, the way it works between yeah, uh, like Flux and something like KPAC today, like if you do want to support, if you will use the, the subpath field that exists on the workload, Flux will pull all of the source code for whatever commit that you're pointing at, and then that bundle reference gets passed to KPAC, and then the subpath reference from the workload also gets passed to KPAC, and then KPAC goes, okay, I know how to do a subpath within this tarball. But it's not flux creating the filter. And so then under that model, well, Shuma's right in that both of those things will trigger downstream resources, but it's up to those downstream resources to determine that this is a no op for me because nothing changed, which, yeah, I think that's fair. 
Yeah. So I just like tell people, don't use that pattern. <laughs> get, get supports branches, use branches. Cool. Um, yeah, but I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Anyway, we can move on. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, this looks like a really interesting conversation. So at this point, we should move it to an asynchronous format. So I was wondering if this one should apply to become a, a new RFC, at least a draft RFC. I don't know. Uh, I don't think we. Uh, what we've just been talking about, I don't think we would need an RFC because we've landed on a solution that's totally possible with our current. Uh, yeah, you know, we would just be uh, switching a template in some examples. Um, yeah. It does suppose we have RFC 14 finalized, though. Um, but yeah, I don't think we yeah. would need a, a net new RFC for this. So, yeah. yeah. That's great. Thank you. Okay, um, time to move to the next item uh, from Scott, Workload Conventions. This is mostly an FII for people, uh, but last week I opened an RFC uh, tentatively claimed 0017 um, that is talks about uh, adding workload conventions to Cartographer. Uh, so this is a capability that we have within the Tonzo application platform that we're looking to contribute to Cartographer. Um, at its core, basically what this component is doing is providing a higher level of choreography, specifically around the, the content and the shape of a, the pod template spec that is sort of being um, contributed to via the source code referenced by the workload and the images that gets built uh, before it gets delivered. Um, so you can do things like um, detecting that a workload is a Spring Boot app and then making changes to the pod template spec that are specifically enabling Spring Boot capabilities. Uh, one of the reasons why we developed this capability is that we've identified sort of a gap that most developers and specifically the workload resource doesn't expose a lot of the knobs that are necessary in order to actually have a workload at runtime be well behaved. This, this can be things like defining uh, liveness and readiness probes that trigger over an HTTP endpoint as opposed to just watching whether the process is alive or not inside the container. Uh, but when you do that, you need to have more specific knowledge about what the runtime process is inside of the container. Because uh, you can't just make an arbitrary HTTP request. You need to know like what path should I make the request to in order for to have the workload to actually participate uh, in the sort of the, the liveness, which is basically just am I up or do I need to be restarted? Uh, versus the readiness aspect is like, am I able to receive new requests or should you send traffic to me? Uh, so, it's, so in order to kind of distinguish those aspects, you kind of have to have workload knowledge. So this is something that can kind of provide that glue uh, by providing new extension points that other people can hook into. Um, that's like the whirlwind summary, uh, but if people read this and put questions on the PR, we can sort of have the conversation there. Or if people have questions here, I can start to answer. Is there uh, more work that needs to be done for the convention service? So it's a feature that we're shipping. Um, so the work would be in order to actually make the contribution to Cartographer. Uh, but like the core capabilities exist and are, are functional today. Is there so a roadmap? Depends map on what you it? mean by work. <laughs> so yeah, I, I guess I, I guess roadmap is what I is yeah. what I meant. Uh, we don't have a publicly facing roadmap right now uh, because it's it's an internal component at the moment. So this is a proposal to open source it uh, into Cartographer. Uh, but certainly we have ideas of ways that we can sort of enhance it going forward. Uh, but like the core 
essence of it is uh, established, at least as it currently exists. Like if there's if there's ideas of like how to improve it, then we can certainly address figure out how to address those going forward. Um, is there like a plan for people working on this to continue working on this? Uh, VMR will staff it, so whatever that means uh, internally, I, I can't really comment beyond that. Yeah, I see an unresolved question at the bottom is like, does this belong in the cartographer repo or a separate repo? And I think all of my concerns come out of that question. Um, so how, like, you just want async conversation on this or? I mean, whatever's easier for people. So, I mean, if sync is better, I can talk sync. If async is better, then that's great. I think uh, related to that, I wonder with the cartographer, like with, with these office hours, would we have office hours for convention service that are separate from cartographer or would we be merging all that? Like, are we saying like, uh, there's enough bandwidth in the cartographer community to discuss core cartographer, as well as any changes that convention service might want to iterate on? I would presume that there would be enough bandwidth in this call, um, especially if it is going to be a component of cartographer. If it's not a part of this call, in other words, not really integrated, then it doesn't make sense necessarily to go through your RFC in the contribution process. It would just be a separate open source project. I guess when you say integrated, um, I assume that the, the, my assumption was that they would always be separate controllers and the cartographer would be writing convention service objects that a separate controller would, uh, would then manage. Yeah, I would fold that under that first unresolved question about whether that's a design goal or not. No. Oh, like, okay. I, I could imagine a world where we basically say this is two new CRDs, it's just another reconciler inside the existing controller. Uh, it, today, it exists as a separate process so with a separate distribution. So, like, that is also an option depending on just sort of what the desires are for the cartographer community. Do you, do you have opinions on some of these unresolved questions, Scott? Or are they just like? I mean, it's partially why they're unresolved. <laughs> um, <laughs> like I, I do think that this is a, a capability that is a gap in cartographer if something isn't plugging it. Um, just because there's a lot that the workload resource doesn't expose intentionally that needs to end up in a running workload in order for that workload to be well behaved on Kubernetes. Um, in terms of like, is this like core cartographer? Is this a subcomponent of cartographer sub project? Like I, I mean, I, I haven't seen, everything I've seen so far is basically cartographer is a single repo. Um, so like, as long as that was true, I would imagine we would try to fold into that model. Uh, if there is a reason why that model doesn't work and like, or if it's like, it's about to evolve to not be that. And this is like an impotence to like, go do that other new thing that you wanted to do anyway. Then I think that could make sense. So I guess my opinion is absent any other reason not to, I would tend to lean towards saying, just put it into the same repo and like integrate it and make it part of the cartographer code base as it is. 
So the goal okay. is to make it feel integrated and it just fit with yeah. whatever we're doing for everything else. Yeah, I definitely don't want it to be a bolt-on. Like that's just when it's absolutely not the intent. I um, guess if it's if if it if it's integrated to me, that means that this team is now the one staffing it. So like and we will be pushing one release and that sort those sorts of things. Like I don't think we would want two, you know, VMware teams working out of the same repository. Yeah, I mean, how it gets staffed is uh, definitely at that level is a question above my pay grade. Um, I'm just saying, I think that makes well a difference as, well as to from, us. From the perspective know? of, uh, from the community perspective, like if it's one project, like there will always be, or at least hopefully there will be um, external contributors who aren't employed by VMware who exist on the different teams. Um, so how that dynamic works is something I think we can figure out. Cool. Um, what, what next steps are you expecting on this, Scott? Uh, just like start a conversation? Yeah, great question. Uh, definitely just wanted to raise it as it exists. Uh, if you didn't get the notification that I created the PR. Um, reading through the RFC process doc, um, there's a few things that are a little ambiguous in terms of how draft PRs get merged. Like the, the actual doc talks about just pushing to the main branch, which I don't have rights to. Um, so how the draft final conversion process happens, I, I, we can figure that out. Um, but I'm definitely interested in kind of getting feedback from the community at large and figure out like one, is this something interesting? Is this an actual problem space that people agree is a potential problem space that's worth solving? Um, and then how to actually go forward with it. Like, as I said earlier, like, we have an implementation, we have design docs. These things are currently internal, um, but we can work to make more of that information public as this process moves on. But also yeah. definitely not looking to just dump it. Uh, this is something that like, I definitely wanna be involved in making it uh, the right fit for a photographer. Yeah, I think um, I, I've, uh, I'll sort of mirrors some of my thoughts that I've shared with you before. Um, to me, the convention service, like in terms of like, is this uh, worthwhile effort? I'm like, yes. I, I think that uh, you know, you're what I've read from you and, and talked with you. Like, you, you've definitely uh, laid out. Here's why this is a gap that needs to be filled. Um, but for me, it. it goes back to the question of is this the choreographer or is this the choreographed and uh, the convention service to me seems very similar to KPAC where if KPAC didn't exist it'd be like oh it, like it'd be really useful to have some controller that's like out there turning source code into images um, and at the same time as saying like that's a great idea um, cartographer is like separating itself and saying uh, we are we are this you know we're the, the choreographer and up until this point that has meant that we don't uh, cartographer isn't involved in any of the lower level decisions about uh, what happens with source code or um, or images or uh, any of those things. Like there, there isn't that sort of decision logic in any of our um, current code. Um, and what our current code does share is a lot of concerns about uh, reading CRDs, uh, re reading objects that are already in the, uh, reported by the API server and then stamping out new objects from them. And that's what uh, Runnable has in common with supply chain, has in common with delivery. Um, uh, and that that seems uh, that question of fit, I think, is really distinct from the question from some of the questions you raised in terms of like, does 
uh, is this a worthwhile project? I'm like, yes, definitely. Yeah, and I don't disagree with anything you just said. Uh, obviously, it's implemented today as an extension point that fits into Cryptographer, and like we can obviously it works. Um, like I said, I haven't demoed it, so you'll just have to trust me that it works. Um, <laughs> but the the question of like how deep is too deep in terms of the knowledge? I think like the way that we approached creating the sort of the relationship of conventions from a choreographer of conventions. Um, I think that's sort of one of the distinction, one of the funny elements. So like when I talk about being able to identify a Spring Boot application and sort of apply a, a liveness or readiness probe that's appropriate for a Spring Boot application, like that exact logic is not what I'm proposing that we contribute to Cryptographer. What I'm proposing is that we contribute the ability for someone else to define that behavior and sort of have that sort of naturally be an extension. Uh, so the actual convention service itself, the core of it uh, is basically similar to how uh, a supply chain can exist, but with that, if it doesn't have all the component templates defined, it's not going to do anything. Or if a workload exists but doesn't have a backing supply chain, it's not going to do anything. The convention service can exist, but if there's no conventions defined, then it's not going to do anything. So it's when operators start to plug in these conventions, then the actual behavior starts to emerge out of that. So for, from that spirit, I see them as similar. It's definitely higher level, but I see the overall spirit as being similar. Mm -hmm. But I also acknowledge like it's, it's subjective. <laughs> and sort of where you want to draw that boundary line is, uh, is valid. Mm -hmm. Any other comment in regard? Scott, thank you for bringing out this this specific topic into the open. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So it looks like we reach end of the agenda. If there is not anything else you would like to discuss, thank you for your time and see you next week. Bye. Bye. Thank you.